hello everyone, welcome. Um, we have an exciting session here today. Um, Heidi Whipple is gonna get us started. Heidi is a math coach and um, she is going to be doing this session on equitable teaching in mathematics. And a big thank you to the Vermont AOE for uh, sponsoring this workshop all the way through so educators can join for free. We're really grateful for that. And we're so happy to see you all here. Um, glad would be glad to see your faces if you feel comfortable turning on your camera. Um, and with that, I, Heidi, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Heidi Whipple, and um, I am a district math coach um, in, up in the North Country Supervisory Union. Um, prior to that, I was the uh, math coordinator for the state of Vermont. And before that, a classroom teacher. Um, I also had um, some short jobs with uh, literacy coaching and math coaching. So um, working with students and teachers is a passion of mine um, and um, adore math. So, um, oh, and the other thing I'll say, um, because this will become relevant at the end of this presentation, is that um, I was just newly um, uh, elected, I guess, as one of the co-presidents for VCTM in Vermont. Uh, becoming a VCTM member is free, um, and there are some great resources and um, excellent opportunities. So join VCTM, become part of our Vermont math um, community. Uh, and Karen Meyer, who will be joining me at some point, um, she's at another meeting right now, uh, is the other co-president. So um, we were excited to do this together. together. Um, and so listening to Erin, um, she was just singing the songs of my heart that I think about all the time, thinking about equitable practices. And um, in my personal uh, math teaching journey, um, as a new teacher and then learning about mathematics and then starting to play around with uh, my own practices, uh, what I found um, without a shadow of a doubt is that I possessed all the power as the teacher. So I designed the structures and the opportunities for students and that when my practices changed, the student outcomes changed. So as I changed, who they were, how they saw themselves, and what students were able to do completely changed. And it humbled me to the ends of the earth. I saw students who couldn't do math doing math that was so awesome. And um, I believe in the very, very core of my heart that all kids can learn. And I believe that all teachers can learn. And um, I think that that's a big message for um, uh, for any of our leaders that are out there, because that's a challenge that I face often is that it seems like everybody ha says that they believe that all students can learn, but that teachers are sorted. They're kind of like in, you know, they're the good teachers or the not so good teachers. And so we need to like give that same grace to teachers and know that all teachers can learn too. All right. Okay. I didn't say myself that I'm an uh, all learners network facilitator. And I guess I should mention that too. Um, and I will say that the most exciting thing that happened this year um, for me in relation to the all learners network is that um, uh, Sandy Stanhope and I offered a course called Ambitious Teaching. And um, it was a three credit course. And basically the whole gist of it was uh, the concept of ambitious teaching is really about the changes that need to be made, like Aaron talked about, um, to make mathematics um, excellent for all students. And um, we really um, addressed content and pedagogy, particularly um, equitable practices, which is, you know, this is part of that work that we had done with them. So um, it was wildly successful. Predominantly the teachers that took it were teachers from my supervisory union, which was awesome because then I could follow up the classes and coach with them and be in their classrooms. Um, and um, I am not one to um, give myself a lot of credit, but um, the feedback that teachers gave um, 
they said things like this was this was this course was the most transformative in my teaching that I've ever experienced. Um, the best class that I've ever taken. I've learned more about math in this period of time than I ever have. And um, the power of that um, um, just meant the world to me. And so hopefully we can be offering it again through the All Learners Network. So um, if you see it, uh, you, you might wanna take it if we offer it again this upcoming summer. Or we can bring it to your supervisor union. All right, so on this first slide, why change? Um, so th the resources that I use this summer to prepare and throughout this presentation are, you know, all NCTM uh, resources, primarily, all of them, I think. And um, so this is a quote from Catalyzing Change. Um, Catalyzing Change for high school, oh, this is the elementary school. Uh, book, but the high school book came out, I think, in 2017, and that was the last time that I went to an uh, NCTM conference, so that was sad that I've been for a while, but anyway, um, why should we change? Why do we need to make changes in the way in which we um, teach math to kids um, and give opportunities for students to uh, learn mathematics? And in the elementary book, it says, it is our responsibility to launch every child on their mathematical journey with confidence in themselves as knowers, doers, and sense makers of mathematics. And with the realization that each and every person belongs in mathematics. And like I said to you, um, when I started playing around with my practices and seeing that those students who normally couldn't do could do these amazing things. Um, I had students who would kind of cover their paper because they didn't want people to see the work that they did because they were embarrassed. And I'd be like, no, 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 uncover that. That is awesome. Come share that. And the difference that that made in that student's feeling of being belonging in mathematics um, and that everyone belonged um, really was powerful for kids. And it's our, it's our responsibility as the adults to make that space for them. Can't change that way. Okay, so the question that's gonna be kind of the overarching question for this time is what's required to create support and sustain a culture of access and equity in teaching and learning of mathematics. So, um, There are three levels of catalyzing change books. Um, if you haven't read them for your level, haven't read the one for your level, I um, totally recommend that you do. Um, these books really get at the beliefs. It was the first book that the students read during our course this summer. And it doesn't tell us how to make these changes, but it really gets at the heart of believing why we need to change. And so this particular chart is um, from an article out of um, Mathematics Teaching and Learning, an NCTM publication. And it has um, the uh, rec key recommendations for catalyzing change from the three levels of the book. So there are four of the recommendations. I only took a screenshot of two of them that pertain to equity. So um, the two that are here are creating equitable structures in mathematics and implementing um, equitable mathematics instruction. So, um, and I focused on the elementary column just because that's where my heart is at. And, um, and, and it's pretty, it's similar through all of the three levels. But um, when we're thinking about creating those equitable structures in our classrooms, we have to be advocates for dismantling those inequitable structures. You know, like Aaron talked about that tracking um, or those groupings that happen or talking about my high, medium, low kids. I mean, my toenails curl when people say that, you know, like they're all our kids. They're all mathematical. They all bring different things to the table and we have to like wrap around and, and uh, you know, like start from where they're at and bring them forward. Um, and we really need to challenge space, spaces of marginality and, and, and privilege. Um, additionally, um, when we're thinking about the um, equitable instruction, 
we have to use research-informed and equitable teaching practices that nurture children's positive mathematical identities and strong sense of agency. So we talk about mathematical identities and agency a lot. I hear those terms all the time. And sometimes I'm even like, math identity, I get that. And their agency, I, I sometimes feel like it's, it's like knowledge that kind of comes in and out of my brain. Like at times I know it so deeply and then at other times I feel like it eludes me. So I was excited to find this particular um, uh, resource again from a uh, mathematics teacher, uh, the NCTM journal that really clearly um, defined mathematical identity, mathematical um, agency and uh, mathematical authority. So when we're talking about kids' mathematics identity, we're talking about seeing themselves as doers, knowers, and sense makers of math. They all make sense of math. It may not be at the level that, you know, like at the sophistication or with the particular strategy that we want them to, but they're all making sense of math all of the time. But it's it's so often that we kind of shut down their thinking because we're we're wanting one particular way from kids um, or you know elevating another student because it's the way whereas this other student has a really creative way of solving but we don't want to diminish their mathematical identity um, we have to be really careful the ways in which we say things to students or the, the things that we value. Like, it, again, we have to be challenging our own beliefs all of the time um, because the things that we say and the things that we do and we're the ones in power can really um, position kids um, positively or negatively. Um, so like, I feel like a student's mathematical identity completely rests in my hands at all times. And what a humongous, honor and scary burden that is like I walk around feeling this responsibility that that I can make or break the belief system of us of a student by what I say what I do and the choices that I make so we have a ton of power to make or break these guys but if that's true then we have the power to make them like I can really change my practices and I can really turn the belief about a student, and I've seen it, I've seen a student be completely shocked that when we're stopping and saying, did you just hear what your smart friend Charlie just said, who has an IEP or whatever, and suddenly he is positioned as um, a, a sense maker and an authority in a particular representation or whatever, that it completely changed that student's idea of who he is in the math class. Thinking about um, mathematics agency, um, we want to make sure that students are confident in themselves, um, that they feel like they want to share their ideas, um, that um, they can see themselves um, using mathematics in the future, um, that this is a place where students are empowered. Like we wanna have students thinking that they can problem solve, solve their problems, use some math um, and having this belief that, uh, that, that they can uh, use this moving forward. Okay. Oops. So whenever I think about um, math in Vermont, I always refer back to EQS. Um, EQS uh, are the education quality standards. And so um, these are the rules that our schools have um, in Vermont. So um, the State Board of Education says you will have um, these standards and these are the rules that you need to follow. And so Vermont says, that educational equity means that every student has access to the resources, opportunities, and educational rigor. So 
there are many occasions, um, and one of the things that I work super hard um, in my schools and across lots of systems um, in my other jobs is that all students need to have access to universal instruction. So all really does mean all. And um, first and foremost, students need to have access. And the way in which um, the opportunities are provided um, give more students entry points to that universal instruction. We need to have um, um, classrooms that are both um, inclusive and differentiated so students are able to experience their grade level math and also receive um, math that is just right for them um, during that space of time. Uh, we need all students to feel like they are a part of their grade level community, uh, not to be uh, doing the walk of shame out of the classroom because they don't belong to this part of the day. Um, but we also simultaneously need to make sure that all students receive the sports that they need when they struggle. Um, and that can happen at different times for different students. So this is um, what our state is saying that we need to do. And I believe this very much. So how did the equitable mathematics teaching practices develop? Um, when the Common Core state standards came out um, in 2010, not only did it include um, the content standards, it also had um, mathematical practice standards. And these are standards that um, we wanted to see students doing. Um, so we wanted students to be um, exhibiting these behaviors along with um, learning their math content. What happened is that um, over the course of a couple more years in 2014, Principles to Action came out and um, the primary purpose of Principles to Actions was to fill the gap between the adoption of these rigorous standards and the enactment of the practices, policies, programs, and actions required for the successful implementation of those standards. So kind of what the national math research was finding is that although we had these math practice standards, without the grownups shifting their practice, students didn't necessarily have opportunities to exhibit these practices. If I go back to them. Uh, so, um, maybe mathematics didn't include a lot of uh, representations, you know? Um, maybe there weren't opportunities for a lot of mathematical discourse. Um, teachers weren't necessarily posing purposeful questions. I mean, this is, oh, these are for the teaching practices. Um, so, uh, so in any case, Principles to Action put out the eight teaching practices. Um, and so these were meant to shift teaching practices to allow the space so that students could then be um, doing their student practices. So they realized, Principles to Action realized that we needed to shift some of what the adults were doing to make space for the students to be able to, um, to demonstrate those mathematical practices. And so, like I was saying before, we needed to make sure that we had um, a clear uh, math goal for our classes, that we needed tasks that promote reasoning and problem solving. We needed to use and connect mathematical representations, um, facil have, facilitate uh, math discourse, pose purposeful questions, um, build procedural fl fluency from conceptual understanding, support productive struggle, um, elicit and use evidence of student thinking. Um, and I was hoping that Karen would be on this call by now, but she's not. Um, this was her slide. Um, but here she put together um, the, the student math practices and the instructional practices side by side. And so you can see that there's a connection. They're not exactly perfectly linear to each other, you know, like connected to each other, but you can see the relationship and how, um, you know, shifting the practice or making sure that there were, um, 
these uh, instructional practices in place, it would allow and make space for those student practices. So this year, um, the publication that came out from uh, NCTM, NCSM, and ASSM as a joint paper um, was continuing the journey. Um, can people uh, either like raise their hand or just even like unmute and say yes or no? Have people read this article? I have not. No. 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 I don't right. think so. Awesome. I'm psyched. I'm psyched that I can share this with you. So this joint paper was really talking about, um, you know, uh, we know that the global pandemic has happened. We know that students have had huge gaps of time where they may have missed um, learning opportunities. And um, what do we do about it? How do we instruct mathematically moving forward? And so, here. The three key ideas in um, continuing the journey um, are grade level content, equitable and effective teaching practices, and advocacy. Erin um, said it so beautifully in the keynote that she was, um, you know, in a situation where she didn't speak up and and regrets that now she was totally just a second year teacher um it would be and and young and um i certainly don't blame her for not having said anything i think she blames herself it seemed you know like it seemed like there was regret for her but um this paper the advocacy pieces of it is talking a great deal about what is it that we need to do to be able to speak up for our students how do we question and challenge the systems that are in place? So that's one of the three big ideas from this article. Um, of course, I adore and appreciate the grade level content. Um, I, am, I am currently, um, I work in 10 schools and I've been a real advocate this year for grade level content and thinking about ways that we can be that what they say is we need to scaffold and support. So we're, you know, like maybe pre-teaching a few lessons that to um, scaffold and support students, but that we're teaching grade level math all throughout the year and the kids are rising to the occasion. So we can't put them back to grade levels of math. Like we, because cognitively they are ready for this math and they have a right to this math. And it may take a couple years of scaffolding and supporting to get you know, all of that backfill and, and those gaps um, kind of filled, but that we need to give kids their grade level content. They have a right to it. And so advocacy is thinking about ways that we can speak up the grade level content. And then in the middle is the equitable, effective teaching practices. And uh, as it says here, that we need to position all students as competent, confident and capable learners and doers of mathematics. And we need to believe that. And that's like the biggest thing is I hear from teachers all the time, well, they can't do it. They can't do it. And they can, like, I know they can because I have been humbled. I've been brought to my knees, like, wow. Like kids have proven me wrong over and over. And I love it when that happens. I'm like, oh, there it is. They can do this. They can do so much more given the opportunities. So this is a fabulous article. Um, and so it's you know not too many pages long. There are a bunch of tables in it um, that have to do with grade level content, productive beliefs, equitable and effective teaching practices. And in each of those tables, there are tons of additional resources that are linked in. Um, and so um, it's kind of like uh, the resources, instead of being the mall where there's like tons and tons of things on sale, it's kind of like a boutique where it's like super nice stuff. And I feel like these articles that are linked into this are into these tables are like the boutique of uh, math resources. So it's really good stuff. And it's been, you know, vetted by the best of the best. Uh, 
So, and just so you know, um, for the VCTM conference that we just had, Jolie Honey is the president of ASSM and she was our keynote speaker and she was one of the three lead authors of this continuing the journey research. So it was really exciting to me to have her speak in Vermont about this continuing the journey. So this is my Bible for the year. This is what I'm using. Like when I feel uncertain or people are challenging my beliefs or whatever, when I feel weak or you know, unsure, I just kind of reread through a lot of this and I'm like, nope, I know that based on our national research and our national organizations that I'm headed in the right direction and I wanna bring as many people along with me as I can. So equitable teaching, productive mindsets and practices. Um, this is from table two in the article um, and I kind of condensed it. But to me, like Erin said, let's see what she said. In order to create change, you have to address mindsets and beliefs. Absolutely. You know, reading the catalyzing change, I feel like changes the, um, the mindsets and beliefs in teachers. And then we need to like um, challenge that. So for around equitable teaching, um, first we need to view mathematics as an interconnected web of concepts, knowledge, and skills. It's, um, it's surprising to me sometimes that um, when teachers talk about um, omitting certain parts of math or um, why are we doing certain things in our math program or that, that they're not seeing the interconnectedness across a great, you know, during in their own grade level and how it's all interrelated. And that if we understand the interconnection and we help kids to see the interconnection, that um, math gets a lot deeper. We have to believe that all students are mathematically brilliant, and they are. They all have a sense of space and they all have a sense of um, number and um, they all bring unique and creative ideas. Um, and we need to honor it, celebrate it and understand it. There are times where kids will explain their thinking and you're like, what the heck are they thinking? But that's on me. I have to dig deeper and ask questions and figure it out because they have brilliant ideas. Um, it is my job to deeply understand the standards and the learning goals in a unit. Every single program that, and, and I've used a ton of math programs. Um, it, at my last um, teaching job, we used three different programs in three years. And although it was painful, it was also like the most amazing PD for me. But every single program has, um, the, like pages at the beginning that explain the, you know, like what are the purposes for the, for the unit. And um, I did a lot of reading of those like gray boxes or like the, you know, the teacher notes and there's a ton of information in there and it helped me to see the interconnectedness of the units and, um, and uh, the thing about understanding the standards deeply was by using those three programs in three consecutive years, I got to see, you know, here are the measurement standards according to this program, and here they are according to this one, and, and the difference between them and really getting at the heart of what do those standards mean, what does it look like, and how, what does it look like when a student does know or they have misconceptions, but that we really have to take on getting to know our standards deeply and not just knowing our program deeply. We have to understand the standards. Elicit and examine your knowledge of students. So students bring a ton of knowledge um, to every single topic. Um, we need to make sure that we are starting from what they do know. Like when students say, I don't know what to do, my automatic response is, well, what do you know? And we start from there. And they have to explain to me what they do understand. Well, which part of it do you understand? So that we're, it's an asset-based asset way of approaching them. Um, and we need to talk about our kids, like my students can do this. They're struggling with this next step. What should I do to help them get to that next step? But always starting from what they do know. 
value reflection and revision. Um, for sure, uh, revision was a big part of my math class. This was in second grade and they were totally capable. Um, I worked really hard at coming up with systems. So I had to come up with these like class systems for ways that I could provide feedback and that students could respond to that feedback. Because if you're gonna give feedback to students, I think that they should have the ability to revise their work. Um, one thing that was funny that happened um, I, without my realizing was that we had an ongoing daily review um, page that we did each day at the beginning of class. And the students had four questions and it was like interleaving, you know, so that, like different questions from different parts of the year. And students would do their work and um, we'd give, we'd give it points, score. They got a point if they put their name on it and then they got a point for each question. And so um, if they got all the answers, they got five points total. And what I noticed is that if a student um, got one wrong, that they were quickly trying to revise it on their own, you know, like after we'd all discussed it so that they could put a five at the top of their paper. And at first I was like, well, what are they doing that for? And then I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, like to get the five, they just had to revise. And so I like made a big deal of that. And uh, um, it was great that you, at any point you can revise and you can improve based on just listening to what's happening. So establishing a culture of feedback. Um, I had to think of ways that I could provide that feedback, either written or verbal to students to help them grow as learners, but I also had to um, put in that space for them to then put it into practice. Um, so one way was if they were doing problem solving, I had a little check sheet and I could check the parts that were present and left blank any parts that were, were not present and hand it back and the kids could um, revise their work and hand it back and then you know get the checks for that. So it was a lot of like um, self-assessment checklists that were, and, and these guys were little, they're seven years old and very, very responsive to it. Um, practice responsive teaching. So using formative assessment throughout a lesson so you can pivot and shift gears right in like change horses in the middle of the stream, so to speak, um, based on the needs of the learners right in front of you. You can also like I call it spinning plates that I could once the kids were underway, I might on the fly set some of kids off in one direction because that was the point of learning that they were at and then provide uh, an alternate opportunity for another group of kids because that's where they were at. So I could be spinning a couple of plates in class at the same time, um, but that was just based formatively on the kids who were in front of me and knowing how I needed to scaffold to allow all of the kids um, to move their learning forward. So these are different um, mindsets and practices that can lead us toward this equitable teaching. Okay. So the equitable teaching practices self-assessment. So when Catalyzing Change, the high school book came out in 2017, one of the things that it had in it um, was the eight teaching practices from, um, from Principles to Action. Sorry, I had a brain skip. And they uh, the chart had the teaching practice, but then it had ways in which to embed equity into that teaching practice. So it was the teaching practice was good, but then we needed to add in this layer of equity. Um, and so I was very, uh, very into this new resource. And at the time, um, I worked at the Agency of Education, and I wanted to somehow take this resource from NCTM and turn it into something that teachers could use for themselves. Um, and so um, I created this resource. Um, it was at this time too, this was the same conference. Um, um, I went to ASSM, NCSM and NCTM in a 10 day stretch. It was like the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and um, at NCSM, that's where I met Karen Meyer. You want to say hi, Karen? <laughs> hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm so late. 
So uh, go ahead. So um, Karen and I met in um, DC at the NCSM conference and um, we were both engaging with these resources and um, Karen had shared with me um, some of the proficiency scales that um, she was using at Stowe High School and um, so that she had created. And so the, this, these scales, these, um, they're like proficiency scales, um, were modeled after Karen's from Stowe. Um, and so I'm going to, Karen, would you be willing to put the link to this uh, equitable teaching practices? Proficiency it's scale? done. And I'm sorry if I'm echoing, I'm in a very big room. Okay. So uh, the thing about this, um, the, these teaching practices or the purpose of this document, um, when I created this, um, my worry was that this would become uh, an evaluative tool. And that is not at all the purpose of it. It was really meant for teachers. Um, so, and to maybe use, you could like collaborate with a coach to guide and support continuous improvement. Um, it's meant to be a self-assessment and determine their own proficiency in the eight teaching practices um, and thinking about what's my next step. How do I take this um, to, uh, you know, how do I move myself from one uh, proficiency to the next? Um, number four, uh, like students, teachers need to try new learning, make mistakes, make adjustments and try again. We need to have just as much grace with teachers as we do with students. Um, making changes is um, messy and chaotic, like Erin said, and um, we need to have space to be able to make those changes, but we need to change. So um, we, we need to have um, support in making those changes. Um, one thing to think about too is um, I didn't want a school to say, okay, we're doing this. You need to work on all eight of these at once. It isn't meant to do all eight at the same time. Um, they need to, uh, and many of these are very interconnected. So when you're working deeply on one of the practices, it often affects the others. Um, but by selecting one practice at a time and working to improve that practice, it can really um, support continuous improvement. Um, I'll show you that the proficient level that where those what uh, resources those come from and how it's set up um, and then the expanding level I'm going to turn to the next page so you can see this is what one page one of the um, pages of this document that addresses one teaching practice looks like and so um, this is the first one. Um, and so the teaching practice that's in green at the top here, this is what comes from principles to action. This is one of the eight teaching practices. So number one is establish mathematics goal to focus learning. Um, the proficient column that's right here, this is the layer of equity that catalyzed and change put onto that. So in principles to action, they're saying we need to make sure that we're um, having this um, goal to focus learning, but then I need to establish learning progressions that build students' mathematical understanding, increase their confidence and support their mathematical identities as doers of math. I also need to establish high expectations to ensure each and every student has the opportunity to meet the mathematics goal. I also need to establish classroom norms for participation that position each and every student as competent mathematical thinkers. And I also need to establish classroom environments that promote learning mathematics as just, equitable, and inclusive. So principles to action just said number one establish math schools to focus learning. But look at the that richness and depth which comes from catalyzing change. So this is the added layer of equity that comes from um, catalyzing change. So the other thing to notice is that in the beginning column, they're all exactly the same. Um, so 
for some teachers, they don't establish a goal for mathematical understanding at the beginning of each and every lesson. So if you're if you are establishing a goal for math learning, you're on the map, you're in the beginning column. And that's a start. And that's that's something to be glad of. And then you can think about how can I move into the developing column in each of these areas. And ideally, you want all four of them. You want to be doing all four of these um, these rows. Like just establishing a goal is a start, but it's not enough. The expanding column is what specifically comes from Karen's proficiency scales. And Karen, I don't know if you want to talk about that. As long as my sound is OK, I can absolutely talk about that. So when you look at the proficient language, that's what we want to do. But we've got to think about what's next. So if we're already proficient, what's next? And what next you'll see in the expanding column is having students take the ownership of this learning, to have students moving beyond what you're doing as a classroom teacher. So it's moving beyond what you are putting out for them, how you're controlling the classroom, how you're owning the classroom, and it's putting it into the hands of the students so that they have that ownership, they have that belief, and they're taking the next step on their own. So that really becomes the expanding as to what goes beyond when you're finished with as the teacher. And I'll say for myself in my classroom with seven-year-olds that there were points at which the students were able to um, get up, present a problem that they had solved and discuss it. And the kids would ask them questions. And they got to a point where I could sit in the back of the room I could help guide and facilitate their conversation, but that they could mostly lead that work on their own. And that's when I felt like I had truly reached a point with this group of kids that they were able to do this on their own. And to me, that was, that was expanding. Um, so that was exciting. So what I'm thinking, I want you to have some time to look through these. Um, so here's what I'm thinking, and I don't know how well this is going to work, so forgive me, but what I'd like for you to do is you have the resource, the link to the resource. Um, Karen, would you be willing to put the feedback slides in there as well? Thank you. I just there. did. For the next few minutes, um, I'm thinking for the next 10 minutes, if you could check out one of the eight teaching practices, read through the proficiency scale, kind of keep in mind where you think you're at. And if you could go then go into the other document and um, on the slide that's the same number as your teaching practice, if you could make a couple of um, observations, a like one or two, or three highlights, uh, highlight two or three of the items that you can sh that we can share as a group. Um, that would be great. How does that sound to people? I think that sounds great, Heidi. And so what you'll see is the first slide of the the shared show is um, a title page, but then each of the pages after that actually link and say what title, which of the practices it is. Um, so you'll be able to scroll through and pick which practice you want to give some feedback on. And I think 10 minutes sounds perfect. Okay, so I'm going to mute myself and turn my camera off so uh, you have the time and space to think. Um, I know that there are not enough people in our session to um, look at every single one of the practices or the proficiency scales, um, but um, I'll click through the ones to the ones where people have written some notes. And if uh, the people who wrote it are willing to talk about it, that would be awesome. So teaching practice number one, establish mathematics goals to focus learning. Does anybody want to share? Um, I read this one. I, I just like that it kept talking about how like the goals are important to making steps to become a better math mathematician. And I've kind of always, I don't know, I've always followed that. I used to do math all the time in Stowe. So it's just knowing that 
building up all of these different ideas and lessons, they have to know like what happened the year before. And I find that there's most success with students if you just take like simple goals and simple steps to them. And then they, it, it's less stressful for them on a topic that's already really stressful for a lot of students. I love the, the comment, success happens one step at a time. That if we can break it down into, here's our, you know, like you said, that we can take just a bite. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Thank you. Looks like uh, practice number two is empty. Uh, number three, use and connect mathematical representations. Well, what's written here is um, using multiple representations allows students a variety of ways to make sense of the mathematics. Um, representations models, drawings, can help students reason and represent their thinking. And representations are a vital tool for problem solving and explaining reasoning. I adore, this is my favorite practice, um, and I've spent a lot of time uh, with this, with students, having students draw pictures. In fact, if they were stuck with anything, I'd say in our class, we said DAP and DAP stood for draw a picture. So if you're stuck, what can you do? You can draw a picture. Um, and that having the ability to generate all kinds of representations in math is powerful for kids. So yes, this is great. Number four. Number five, pose purposeful questions. Who wrote this one? I wrote that one. Um, I was just noticing how the indicators in there um, really talked a lot about elevating student voice, even though the teacher's development is about the types of questions that we ask. The real purpose of it is for students to be able to use their voices and build their identities. Absolutely. Six, this teacher has fluency from conceptual understanding. The representations help with this, just saying that you're gonna build your procedural fluency from your conceptual understanding. They're all very interrelated. Number seven, support productive struggle in learning mathematics. Um, I had one of the bullet points there. I just wanted to, I thought it was interesting and really important to make sure to balance that students have enough support and scaffolding um, along with knowing that there are really very high expectations for all students. I thought that was a good balance. I didn't write it, but I like the way it says just enough support. Um, sometimes you try so hard to offer so much support and then you're like, oh, the productive struggle is gone. Especially for little ones, they're so cute. Communicate caring and confidence for sure. Um, it takes a lot of um, building of um, norms and expectations at the beginning of the year. You like your first six weeks are really about believing that we can learn, um, creating an environment that's supportive, um, being able to ask questions, being able to say when they don't know something, making math time all of the day, but making the math classroom a really safe space takes time and effort. Um, this is like, you don't need a separate SEL class. This is SEL embedded in our day, but making this um, caring, um, and safe space for um, students to be able to take risks and learn. And like I said, in our school community, we need to be creating that same space, safe space for teachers so that they can make some of these adjustments and talk about their successes and failures so that we can continuously improve. This is great. And last but not least, Number eight, elicit and use evidence of student thinking. 
I wrote this song, so I just wrote things that I liked that were either explicitly stated or implied. Um, the idea of cultivating a positive mathematical identity by it is important that students share their, their thinking publicly, visually, and verbally. It's that way they own it. You aren't representing it. It's theirs. It builds their confidence. Um, and it's reinforcing when other students start to agree. I teach in a middle school. So taking that risk sometimes openly when you're not 100% sure of what of what your understanding is, you know, it's very adventurous. And when others agree, it's so reaffirming. And then you could just see like the, the relief that, okay, yeah, I am going in the right direction. Um, and mistakes are, are valued. We're, we're all making mistakes. And as soon as it's said and shown, it's so much easier for the students to see the mistake. Oh, I get it now. And then they take that ownership right back as soon as they, they fix it or add something to it. To, Kind of send us all in the right direction so it's it's a mistake that still makes you feel good in the end awesome thank you so much for sharing um one thing that i did in my class is when students would make representations um we would um and they were particularly awesome and um unique we'd write their name on it and i'd laminate it and um put a piece of uh velcro on the back and it would go up on a chart so then when other kids were problem solving, they could go up to the chart and take that representation to their desk so that they could use that student's thinking to try it out for themselves. And so this idea of making it like owned and public and usable by other students um, or making resource charts where students showed um, different representations for uh, multiplication or fractions um and putting the names next to them all and so you know students maybe who are at an earlier level um so maybe they showed their multiplication as an array or you know and not as an area model but that they were on the chart and that their name was represented so that everybody was present as creating these different representations and any way that I could incorporate all of the students and make their thinking visible created this atmosphere that they were all resources to each other. Um, so it's all those teeny tiny choices that we make that can really build the community and can really make them feel like, like members of this math class. So the tiny choices that we make have huge power on how the children feel and how they see themselves as doers of math. These are great. I wish there were more of us and that we could have had conversations. I apologize for um, having to uh, not have breakout rooms, but thanks for speaking up. All right, so now I got to find where, where we are here. Okay, um, so this slide is um, from, it's, it's in the book, um, Catalyze and Change, the elementary version, but it's, uh, a, it's actually from the book, Taking Action. Um, Deanne um, Hinker, I think is how you say her last name, was one of the creators of this chart. And the idea being that here are the eight math practices. We need to always start with this math learning goal. And then that goal is going to focus our learning to either be implementing tasks or building our procedural fluency. And then while we're doing that, the other four practices are going to be, five practices are going to be happening simultaneously. They're all totally interrelated and lead back to establishing the next um, practice. But um, you can see um, this organization of how uh, they're happening in a math classroom. I really like this. And Heidi, I will jump in because I, I realized after we had said that this was part that I would say that we often see them listed linearly they're listed one through eight and we get the false perception that they are meant to go one through eight and that we can't touch the eighth practice until we've done all of the rest. And so we really need to remember that it is not a hierarchy. It is not a linear progression, but they actually work together and their strength comes from being together and working together. Um, support for ambitious teaching. So unambitious teaching is continuing to do what we've always done, um, not making changes, you know, just doing the same 
that we've done and having our high, medium, low kids, grouping our kids according to ability, the things that research is now clearly showing us um, is not beneficial for students. That would be unambitious teaching. In the math research um, from NCTM, this terminology of ambitious teaching is talking about the change that um, research is making really clear to us that we need to be making for all kids. And when we think about the all learners network and all means all, we all need to be thinking about how do I make this shift to ambitious teaching? And ambitious mathematics teaching must be equitable. Equity is about fairness in terms of providing access to each learner with alternative ways to achieve, no matter the obstacles they face. And believing in each student's potential to do challenging mathematics reasoning and problem solving. They can do so much given the opportunity. Teachers need to pay attention to the instructional opportunities that are provided to students. And like I said before, the, the person who gets to make those um, decisions on a daily basis is the classroom teacher. Like the power that we possess, like I said, is thrilling and alarming to me at the same time. Like it's such a huge honor and responsibility that I have, like every little move I make Everything I say, every choice that I make has an impact on the learners. And so I need to be really conscious and mindful of how is this landing on the kids and um, being okay with, well, I don't think that landed really well. So I think I'm gonna try and change that tomorrow because I'm growing and learning. I'm, I learn every single day. Um, as a coach, I learn every single day the way that I say and do things the way that I model things, um, and the feedback that I'm providing to adults. How did that land on them? What, you know, did, did that build them up or break them down? And like, we all have to use our power wisely. So that's the idea behind ambitious teaching. Um, so the resources that we talked about earlier are all talking about, you need to be doing this and here's why. But we wanted to be able to provide you with a resource that can tell you some of the, and here's how. So we're not just leaving you with this idea like, oh man, I think I need to change, but I'm not really sure how. Um, these books came out, I think it was, two the, maybe that was 2017 as well. I think so. I think it was at that conference that these books came out, the Taking Action series. So these were um, written after um, Principles to Action, and um, it takes the eight teaching practices, and there is a chapter for each practice, like here, are, here is what research says are ways that you can enact these practices. These books are fabulous. Um, and I haven't read that, them as deeply as I should, but I'm going to get to be able to because um, VCTM is going to be offering a, um, another book chat this year. This is our third year of um, running a book chat in Vermont. If you sign up for the book chat, you get one of these books for free, which is awesome. And then um, we get together with Vermont educators and um, you know read a chapter or two and come together and talk about the books. It's great, you know, like doing a book study for me is always great. Um, hearing what other people have to say is great. It also forces me to read the book because otherwise it sits on my desk forever and ever and ever. And um, these books are leveled. So there's a K-5, a six, eight and a high school book, which is really great. So educators are getting uh, examples right at their level. So, cause that can be hard if you're a high school teacher and you're getting elementary examples, it's maybe not helpful. Um, but um, so uh, Karen and I will be uh, sending out information to uh, the Vermont, uh, the VCTM folks uh, so if you are not a VCTM member, sign up, it's free, and you'll get the information about how to join this book chat. Um, and this is really going to help us um, shift the needle toward ambitious mathematics teaching and thinking about ways that we can embed equity in our practice every day. 
it's 5.30 now. So Karen, I'm gonna let you take it away from here. So there's a couple of extra additional resources. Heidi, I don't know, have you shared this whole slideshow already? No, but I will right now. Okay. So we have some additional resources and some other quotes. At this, uh, Heidi has landed on it right now. When teaching practices change, student outcomes change. This is a quote by the famous Heidi Whipple. Um, and it's 100% true. And it's what we do as teachers in our classroom as to what actually we're going to be looking for outcomes from students. So um, that's a really important quote. But Heidi, if you skip all the way down, so you'll see a couple of those slides as uh, Heidi shares the, the slideshow. But at the very end, um, one thing we want to remember is when we look at our teaching practices, there are already in place student math practices. Um, and in the additional resources, you'll start to see all of these being defined. The slide that's showing now is actually the math practices with student look fors. So the, the practice itself makes sense of problem solving and perseverance solving them is a very large hefty statement. Um, but here are some actual look for is what is a student going to be doing if they're using this math practice. So in the additional resources, you will see all of these defined. And I believe if I go down, you'll actually also find um, the teacher look fors. So we have the um, self assessment that Heidi shared. And this also is just defining again for you. You'll see the connection between the learning skills or the rubrics that Heidi created and what's actually here. This is where it started. So I'm, I'm not opposed to staying if people have any questions. Um, if you need to go, I wanna honor your time. I really appreciate that you uh, came and spent the time with us. And I, I hope that this was, uh, uh, I'm definitely passionate about this. This is where I live and dream and think about all the time. Um, but I hope that there are some pieces that resonated with you and that um, it can be helpful for you. Um, if anybody has questions or comments, please speak up. And I'll just add to that. This is, you know, as coaches, Heidi and I, this is what we get to do all the time in collaboration. But having all of you here to collaborate with us and collaborate with each other is what it's really all about. Mm -hmm.